Uh, the afternoon has no, nobody ha has the word professor before the title this afternoon. Uh, it is all high level uh, industry practitioners. Uh, we're gonna do the theater panel first and the music panel this afternoon. And there's a reason for that. Uh, the public performance right in, in, the, in the copyright statute originated with theater uh, in the, mid, the middle of the 19th century. Um, and it arose as a way to prevent theater piracy. And it, that was extended to music about 40 years later, at, at just at the turn of the 20th century. And the public performance, uh, the right of public performance uh, comes up most frequently and almost entirely within the context of theater and music. Uh, this panel, this theater panel, is going to be very uh, industry-based. It's the sort of industry that very few uh, practitioners, uh, even in related fields like music, have any idea uh, how the rights structure works in theater, who has rights to do what. They know it's collaborative. There's always issues about whether directors have a right to do things. Is, is it the playwrights? Is it the actors? Uh, but you're not going to hear very much about the rights of the performer. You, you will hear a little bit, and we're going to examine that, but you're not going to hear very much about the rights of the live actors. And the reason is they really don't have very many. Uh, I, w I would say they have none, but they might have a little bit, maybe. Uh, but the, so, so you'll be, you know, it's interesting to have um, uh, an industry panel uh, in a performing performer's rights symposium in which the performers have no rights. Uh, but that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, and about uh, 40 minutes into, after, after the second presentation, we'll even be uh, contrasting a live skit starring myself and my executive editor, Mike Deerington. Um, and we'll be showing you the same, the same skit uh, in video form. And you'll learn a little bit about why the different mediums contain different rights. Um, but to start, I am pleased uh, to introduce David Foe, who is the Director of Business Affairs, the Dramatist Guild. That's the, um, it's, not, it's not a union technically, it's a guild, but they're related, uh, for, the, for playwrights. Uh, David uh, is, practices intellectual property law, uh, entertainment, art, and business law. Uh, he has worked in the fashion industry, the sports and fitness industry, um, photography, graphic design, really the whole gamut of um, intellectual property, entertainment law. Uh, he, before becoming an attorney, he was a music journalist and a publicist. He holds uh, Masters of Science and Arts degrees, and he spent some time in South Korea as a Fulbright Scholar. He is also the co-chair co of the Fashion Law Committee for the New York State Bar Association's and, uh, Entertainment and Sports Law Committee. Uh, it's my pleasure to present uh, Mr. David Foe. All right, thank you. Uh, since it's so pertinent, I should probably mention that I, I just you became the... Um, Here's your microphone. Yeah. Is this not on? Uh, you want to work with this. Okay. I should probably also mention that I just became the uh, vice chair for the Dramatic Arts and Visual Arts Committee for the American Bar Association, since that is pertinent to this panel. Um, let, me, let me just get a couple of uh, raised hands quickly. Uh, how many people still feel a little bit deflated and depressed from the congressman's comments? <laughs> a lot of you? Okay. Well, um, how many people are from St. Louis, Missouri? Okay, good, because I was, I was reading the paper this morning, uh, and I was reading the hockey scores, and I won't give any spoilers, but I did see one good headline, uh, and that's that um, uh, a defenseman from the New York Rangers, who is so terrible, uh, has just been traded to uh, St. Louis, which I understand is something of a rivalry against the Nashville Predators. So that's really good news. You can feel, uh, feel a little bit uplifted. Wade Redden is now at the St. Louis Blues. He's a lifetime loser, in my opinion. And he is terrible, and he was overpaid to boot, and now he's part of another team. So we can all be happy about that. Uh, <laughs> uh, truth is an absolute defense to defamation. <laughs> Um, the goal of my talk here today is to give a, a foundation of, of the typical historical structure of a live performance license deal. Now, I don't know if you went over this in copyright class or not, because it's, it almost seems so basic that I've, I've, I think in my copyright class in law school, we didn't discuss it, but there are five ways to exploit uh, copyright. Uh, it's distribution, reproduction, uh, right to make a derivative work, a display, like a painting, and live performance. 
And then it, all the rights are, are sort of combinations and splices of that. So uh, if you're in a work for a publisher, you're doing distribution and reproduction, uh, you're, you're invoking both those rights. If you're a music attorney, you're going to figure out literally billions of ways to splice up and combine those rights into so many different copyrights that it's unbelievable, um, at least to a non-music lawyer. Uh, and my, the other goal of my, uh, of my talk today is to convey the point of view of one side of these transactions for live performance licenses, and that's the author's perspective. Um, because it, unless you work, uh, it, these deals are important at this level, because if you were to graduate today, take the bar tomorrow, right, in, in this fantasy world, and then decide to work in theater law, unless you work for one of a handful of law firms, two of them represented here today, uh, you're probably not going to be working for Broadway producers, uh, which is really where the most money is. That's how you can make, you can make a very good living doing that. But if you want to work in theater law today, you're probably either going to be working for authors and not authors who have already been produced on Broadway. Uh, you're, going to be you're going to be working for uh, up-and-coming authors, uh, or you're going to be working for up-and-coming producers, or you're going to be working for authors and producers who are not active in, um, in New York City yet, or in Los Angeles or Chicago, some major uh, city with a, with a very large theater scene. Um, one, of the, one of the many reasons I'm, I'm glad to be down here is because I actually have family here. My uncle Ed lives down here. He was a rector in, the Episco in, a, in an Episcopalian church for his life. And at one point he got the, uh, I haven't seen him since I was four or five years old, so I'm gonna see him for dinner tonight. Uh, and uh, the only, one of the few things I, I remember about him that my mother reminded me of is that he, um, he had an opportunity to advance in the church hierarchy. He was offered the, the position of bishop in Louisiana, and he, uh, he turned it down. And I don't know, I'll find out at dinner tonight whether he turned it down to, to, because Nashville's so nice or if he turned it down because he felt Louisiana was so awful. Either way, it says something nice about Nashville. Uh, and I feel sort of a kindred spirit with him working at the Dramatist Guild because I think at least part of that impulse to stay in Nashville where he was at, 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 as a rector, rather than taking a, a higher uh, a job higher in that hierarchy, was that he wasn't going to be isolated from the local participants. And it's strange to be in Times Square in an office to be involved with all these, with taking calls from our 7,000 members around the country uh, who are essentially local participants in their locality. Uh, so that's, that's my perspective that I'm going to be bringing today. Um, to give a brief history of the, of the Guild, uh, Shane mentioned that the Guild is not a union, uh, but it is a trade association. Um, just for the sake of introducing some case law into this, the reason that authors are not uh, uh, unionized, that dramatists, that being people who write plays, people who write books for musicals, people who write lyrics for musicals, and even uh, people who compose music for musicals. Those are all dramatists. Uh, it, it, it's a quirk of history that they're not able to unionize. In 1945, there was a case called Ring v. Spina, um, where the producers uh, filed suit against the Dramatist Guild uh, for uh, acting like a union. And uh, the, well, between Ring v. Spina and Bar v. Dramatist Guild, uh, we were accused of acting like a union. And both times the court said um, that either, in one case, they're not acting like a union, but they can't be a union because uh, authors own their own, they continue to own their own copyright. And then in, in uh, Bar v. Dramatist Guild, which is a 1983 case, um, the League of, I think it was at the time called the League of um, Producers. I think that's all it was, right? I mean, now it's the League of Theater Owners and Producers. But the League of Producers had sued the Dramatist Guild and said we were acting like a union. And the court said, well, by the doctrine of unclean hands, uh, if they're acting like a union, you're acting like a union too. And then the, the case quickly went away after that. Um, but that's, that's the historical quirk. Choreographers, they own their copyright, but they're part of a union. They're part of the SDC, the, 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 the stage directors and choreographers. Uh, but we do not. So what we are is a trade association, and when we advise members, we can't enforce minimums, but we can 
say what standards have been crossing our desk. What, what should you expect for payment? What should you expect for treatment? Um, and this is directly opposite from how uh, writers are treated in Hollywood. Uh, and I think Carol's going to talk a little bit in more detail about this. But in, in Hollywood, directors belong to the Writers Guild of America, uh, which is sort of a sister organization of ours, but they are unionized. So that means that they get certain minimum payments they, that they don't have to, you can negotiate above the, this minimum, but you will get paid a, a minimum amount, plus you get health and pension benefits. But you give up your copyright. The studio owns the copyright with a couple of carve-outs, carve including uh, theatrical production. But by and large, you're, you're selling your copyright for a salary and for security. In the theater, you keep your copyright, but it comes at a very steep cost that not all dramatists are prepared to absorb. It comes at the cost of health and pension benefits. Our members don't have health insurance uh, unless they go out and figure out how to get it themselves. And, uh, and they have to negotiate for every penny they have. We can't enforce a minimum. Um, except at the first class level, we have a specific arrangement with the, with the members of the guild uh, that says that, for example, um, you'll get uh, $37,500 as an advance on a play for first class production, uh, at least. Uh, but if, you don't, if you're not a member of the guild and you write a play and you want to be on Broadway, you might get nothing. You might sell your firstborn. Uh, so in that way, uh, we're, uh, we contrast with Hollywood. So what is this, this standard deal that I'm talking about? The, these are, the standard deal that I'm about to describe has nothing to do with first class or even really second class commercial theater. It has to do with your garden variety, community theater, or even a, a regional theater uh, that's outside of a major city. Um, first is money, royalties, and advances. Now, the advance depends, obviously, on the size and the location and the prestige of the theater. Uh, and by and large, what I usually tell people is, if you want to know what to negotiate for an advance, there's a very easy formula. You, the advance is supposed to be an estimate of what you would make on a royalty in your first week at that theater uh, and with one assumption, the assumption being that you filled the theater to 90% capacity. So if you have a 100-seat theater and you charge $5 a ticket and you have one performance that week, then that's $500 is, is the gross. And then you assume 90% capacity, that's $450. And then you would guess whatever your royalty would be of that. So if it was 5% royalty, it would be what? $2,250. <laughs> it would be an odd number. But that's how you figure it out. It's, a good, it's, it's fair. It doesn't assume that you're going to fill it to 100% capacity. It doesn't assume that it's going to um, you know, look like this room at, what, 20%, 30% capacity. Uh, and then the royalty is typically 5 to 8% of the gross weekly box office receipts. That's, uh, uh, there's usually a distinction between um, the royalty you get before a producer will um, will earn back his, his capitalization money, right? It takes money, it takes money to put a show on stage just for that first production, uh, and that's the capitalization of the show. So, one, so a typical deal would say that a, uh, uh, an author would get five to seven percent of the gross weekly box office receipts until recoupment, and then six to eight percent afterwards. Um, now, as soon as as soon as we wrote the APC, the approved production contract, which my colleagues are going to refer to a lot, I believe, uh, we, we codified this with the, with the League in, I think, 1992, 1991. And within months of that, uh, somebody on the producer's side of the equation came up with this thing called a royalty pool which kind of threw the APC into disarray, literally months after we negotiated something final on it. And uh, royalty pools, just briefly, are a way of shifting the risk um, from, the, uh, from, the from the producer and their investors over to the royalty pool participants, including, which include the authors, and might include the directors and the actors. And, um, so uh, when you think about risk, in the theater, 
you have, there's an inordinate amount of, if you talk to a producer like Jed Bernstein or any of the, any of the big producers in New York, they'll tell you that theater is a back-end business, that there's a lot of risk up front and we all make our money on, on the back end. And that's true. But I think there's an inordinate amount of, of front end risk uh, on the, from the author's position. Why? Because, the, because they started with a blank piece of paper and then they created something from it. Uh, and sometimes it takes months, but sometimes it takes years. It can take two years, it can take 10 years to come up with a play. And that's a lot of time that you spend essentially on spec, uh, especially at the beginning of your career. Uh, and then when they finally get produced, a lot of times they're pressured into trying to take a lesser deal by the producers by saying, look, I've got hundreds of scripts in my room, in my office, and, uh, and you're lucky just to be getting produced at all. That's sort of like, well, I guess it's like any other position where the leverage is, is, is off skew, but it's essentially, how would I put it? Well, I don't know. It just seems like an awful lot of years to be spending on working on a project. They've already been burdened with a certain amount of risk. So, when, so that, then when they get produced, the producer, the, the show still might be a flop, right? So there's even more risk. And that's the risk that the producer is trying to shift. It's not unreasonable for the producer to shift risk to some of the other creative parties because it makes, that, it makes it that much easier for the producer to go back to the investors and say, I've arranged for this shift in the risk so that you guys will get paid back sooner rather than later. Uh, so how do they shift the risk? Well, one way is with royalty pools where they say, well, out of the net operating profits, we're going to take a certain amount, 40%, 35% of the, of the weekly net operating profits, and that's what you cre the creatives, the people in the royalty pool, are going to divide up. So all of a sudden, you're not getting paid 6% of gross. You're getting paid 15.58% of this smaller pool that, gets, that's, uh, that goes up to 16.67% after recoupment. Now, can anyone imagine why it was at 15.56% and then at recoupment it goes up to 17.78%? Uh, anyone know why? It's completely arbitrary. It was, it was famously <laughs> written down on a napkin in, in negotiation. We can assume it was a bar napkin. And then after that, there's a further way of, 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 doing, uh, of, of shifting the risk to, away from the investors and, uh, and towards the creatives. Uh, it's called amortization. And I will say just one thing about amortization is that it's usually uh, 2% or up to, what, usually $200,000 or, or $250,000. Uh, that goes immediately back to the investors and the capitalization. But when uh, my colleagues and I were discussing who would discuss amortization, I, I, I very quickly said, not it, because it, it's very complicated and, and it takes years to understand with any facility. Um, so I leave it to Carter and Carol to explain that. But there are non-moneyed ways of being compensated in the theater that are very important. So you have your advance in royalty for the money side, and then the next important thing, does anyone know what's, what's important besides money to, to an author? Anyone want to venture a guess? Fame. So you have billing. Uh, and billing is, tra is traditionally, I remember when um, the, we brought in a director of creative affairs into the Dramatist Guild, and he said, why can't you have uh, just a simple, like, one sheet contract that's just straightforward in plain English. Why are you guys mucking up the works? And, you know, you'll, you'll get used to this as a lawyer, of hearing this, and just be like, come on, you know, I just got here. I don't, you know, I haven't been around for 100 years. I don't know, you know, I, I didn't come in and make this all complicated. I'm just reacting to the market the way it is. But a good example of why things have a history and why things get so complicated can be found in billing. Because you'd figure, well, the billing, you know, there's the title, and the billing is going to be 30% you know, uh, the size of the, of the title. Okay. Well, what if the title has different font sizes in it? 
So is it 30% the biggest letter in the title or the 30% of the smallest? Well, okay, it's 30% of the biggest letter in the title. Uh, okay, well, um, that's that title. We also have an artwork title now. All right, so now we've got to figure out what to do with the artwork title. So the regular font title, we have this standard now where the billing is 50% of the font size, generally. I think it's 40% in the APC, right? But 50% uh, of the font size of the, of the title is where the, is the uh, playwright's name. And, uh, and uh, no less than 30% the largest font size in the artwork title. So that's a good example. You can, you can, just from that clause alone, you can see how there must have been a history where it started out simple, somebody did something clever, and then they had to add a clause, somebody did something else clever, then they had to add another clause, and now we have this big complicated thing, and, uh, and remove clauses from that billing provision at your peril. Uh, another issue with billing is that the author's name it needs to be directly under the title on a line by itself. And this becomes important as more and more people get their name on the marquee, get their name on the posters. So you have the, the producer who's, who's essentially putting together the money and making sure that, that this thing happens. That guy gets billing. You, you know that, that, that he or she is going to get good billing because uh, money talks. Uh, then you have, what if you have a star director? Well, of course, if you have a star director and they're going to bring people in and, and into the seats, then you want to have them uh, on the poster as well. What if you have a, a no-name director? Does that person get equal billing? What if you have a designer who wants billing? What if everyone, what, what, what if you have, uh, if you have Al Pacino uh, on your play, you want that person to get billing. But what if you have an up-and-coming actor that Maybe, you know, are they a star? Are they not a star? Have they been established? The more names that you have crowded around the title, the less significant each name is. Um, so that's, uh, and then the, the final thing on billing is that if anybody receives a biography, the author receives a biography. Now, in terms of, there, uh, that's, the money, the compensation, and that's the non-moneyed billing compensation. Uh, besides that, there is another issue that's very important to the authors, and that's control. Control over the dialogue, the text, and everything else uh, uh, surrounding the script itself, the title. Uh, so typically, you would have a clause in the contract that says no changes shall be made, uh, including the title, dialogue, or stage directions without the author's prior written consent. All such changes shall become the sole and exclusive property of the author without lien claim or encumbrance. And it's that standard that I can just say that off the top of my head. The, uh, um, you know, the problem comes uh, that we see most often is with stage directions, uh, where uh, a director might want to change something from stage, interstage left, rather than interstage right. I'm not an author, I don't know how significant that is. If a, if a director wants to change a red couch into a blue couch, that might be extraordinarily significant to the author. That might have part of a larger symbolism uh, that, that this director's messing with. So stage directions are generally included in the things that can't be changed. Um, and then finally, the future use of the play is important. Uh, if a, um, in, a, in any contract that's uh, second class commercial or above, so that would include Broadway or West End, we have these things called subsidiary rights. Actually, we have them at the Lord level and at the off-off Broadway level, and I'll talk about that in a second. But what are these things called subsidiary rights? Well, they're subs the word subsidiary implies that, uh, that there's something that anchors them. There's some original thing. That, they, that these subsidiaries spring out of. Like a wholly owned subsidiary, you know that there's an original company behind that uh, that owns this, this uh, spawn, so to speak. Subsidiary rights can be thought of as, um, as throwing a pebble or a, a stone or a rock in a pond. That's the original production. The ripples are the subsidiary rights. Uh, if a producer comes and puts your play on Broadway, that, gives, that is a big rock. That's the biggest rock we have. That's a lot of ripples that go on a for a long time. Uh, and that 
obviously builds value. Something that runs for a certain amount of time, something like Phantom of the Opera or Wicked, it's going to tour, it's going to make money, it's going to be performed at the stock and amateur level, so that's going to make money. And it wouldn't have done that if it hadn't been put on Broadway. It wouldn't make the same amount of money uh, if it hadn't been on Broadway. So in return for that gratitude, uh, for, or in gratitude for that effort by the producer, the producer gets essentially a kickback on the future use of that play. Um, now at the off-off-Broadway level, at the showcase level in New York, typically we, we've, we see 3% uh, of the author's um, uh, gross uh, of the author's net income from future uses for two years after that play. Um, now, first, let me say why would an off off Broadway uh, theater get any subsidiary rights? Well, that's because, um, on one hand, they're bringing in critics, and those critics can uh, make or break the play, and you're getting real New York City theater critics. Uh, and, Another reason is that it's in New York City. That looks good on the play's curriculum vitae. Uh, so they would get 3% for two years from the play. Because 20 years after the, the showcase, it's not reasonable to say this success that happened 20 years after the showcase is due to the, to the showcase. So you try to keep, you try to keep it close uh, temporally. Lort theaters, uh, which are uh, specific uh, membership group of theaters that are generally um, regional theaters, like McCarter Theater or, uh, or uh, in, New in southern New Jersey or the Guthrie in Minnesota, uh, Mark Taper Forum out, out in the West Coast, the, they would typically get 5% for five years. Now, when you move into commercial theater, these get very big. Off, uh, uh, second class, off-Broadway commercial theater would typically get 10% of the author's net uh, going up to 40%, uh, but, but you have to be careful, and that's for 10 years after that, after that show, but you have to be careful for that, with that because if you have a showcase that leads to a regional, that leads to an off-Broadway, that leads to Broadway, suddenly you might be paying 3%, then 5%, so now you're at 8%, then you might be paying 10 to 40%, so let's be generous and just say it just gets to 20%. So now you're paying 28% of your net income as an author, and, uh, and then, God forbid, it goes to Broadway after that, because then you're, you're paying another percentage after that. And then you have to pay taxes. So you, you're left often with less than 50%, 50 cents on every dollar. Um, and then that is, that is essentially the deal. The only thing I will close with is that there's a trend towards uh, d directors trying to claim a certain percentage from authors, and, and the Guild takes a very strong st stance against this. Uh, the director's saying, well, we, deserve, we did this play, and we put our heart and soul into this play as well. We want 5% of the author's income. So now the author might get 45 cents on every dollar. But if they deserve it, they deserve it. But our response generally is, well, directors are unionized. They get paid by the producers. They get health and pension benefits. You go to the producers when you want that 5%. Um, the problem is, is that the uh, producers say no <laughs> to the directors. So the directors say, well, they said no, so now we're coming back to you. Uh, the general uh, hierarchy of power in, in the theater that you're going to learn if you get into this field, which is very, um, very quirky, uh, is that the producers have the money, the directors have collecti collective bargaining, and the authors have the law. And it's an interesting to see how the money and collective bargaining and the law all play out together. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, David. Yeah. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Carter McGowan, who works for Sendroff and Baruch. Who, and while they're only a, they're a very small firm, but they are a very powerful one in the theater industry. Um, Pretty much any show you've heard of probably has a name attached to it. Uh, Carter began her legal career at the Artist Group East. She then, uh, as an agent, she then uh, moved on to Richard Frankel Productions, where she was the director of business affairs. Uh, Richard Frankel Productions is another big, uh, uh, it's a big name in the theater industry. Um, she worked on, she worked on over 100, of the, as the part of the legal team for over 100 Broadway shows. Um, 
now in her, in her current role at Sendroff and Baruch. Uh, she represents all manners of uh, theatrical artists, the creatives, as David referred to them. Um, producers, directors, writers, uh, playwrights, uh, composers, probably some designers, orchestrators. Uh, theater is the most collaborative art form. Uh, and you can tell that by looking at Carter's clientele. Um, she also serves on the faculty of the arts management programs at uh, Long Island University. Uh, and she's also taught at Kentucky and uh, Brooklyn College. Uh, she's spoken in front of the New York State Bar Association, uh, Lafayette College, Ithaca, uh, the Women's Project, and the American Society for Theater Research, which, by the way, had their national conference in Nashville about a month ago, um, and has been published in uh, multiple uh, law journals. She has her MFA from uh, CUNY Brooklyn. Now, she has a law degree from Cornell, uh, and she has an MFA in dramatic writing from Tisch. Uh, which is NYU's uh, drama school. Without further ado, I would like to present uh, Ms. Carter McGowan. Thanks so much, Shane. Um, as you might have heard from, from Shane's uh, introduction of me, I am also a writer. So I know that the majority of plays and musicals have lifespans that are poor, nasty, British, and short. Um, this, is, this is not the most uh, perky afternoon, I guess, we're giving you here. Um, but mostly they're spent on the author's laptop or on the desk of overburdened agents, managers, literary managers, uh, or play contest readers. I'll give you an example. My last play uh, is a musical. So far in the last five years, it's earned $700, <laughs> and we've spent $2,000. <laughs> on music rights. So we have a net loss of $1,300, and we consider that a success. Um, so that's, but I'd like to talk today about the lifespan of those plays and musicals which do make it out of what we lovingly call developmental hell and into actual production. Although even once into actual production, actual commercial production, and when I say commercial production, I'm really talking Broadway, off-Broadway, and the national tours that flow from those productions. Um, once you're in commercial production, in any season, 70 to 80 percent of all commercial productions close without returning their investment to their investors. So no matter what you're talking about, it's a field that is, is rife with risk and rife with failure. I'm going to pay special attention. I'm kind of going to bounce off something that Dave said. I'm going to pay special attention to subsidiary rights and also to royalties. Royalties as the main way that authors, are, authors' rights are monetized by their relationship with the producer, and subsidiary rights because they are the way not only authors, but as you heard from Dave, directors, regional theaters, um, and producers, and some other players we'll talk about, are swept along on the author's coattails because that's the way they manage to continue to monetize their rights in the play, not only with regard to that first class production, the Broadway production, or the national touring production, but also for a period of several years afterward. Um, as a preliminary matter, I'd like to explain that I'm focusing on the commercial life of a play, although you will hear a lot about the not-for-profit world if you start to work in the theater world, because we really have a bifurcated system of play production in the United States. We have the commercial world, which is based in New York, with Broadway and off-Broadway productions, and then spins off tours throughout the country. And we have the not-for-profit world, which is based throughout, in cities throughout the country. We call them regional theaters, because in New York, we are very uh, provincial about these things in theater. And anything that's not in New York, therefore, must be in a region. Um, it's called regional theater as soon as you leave the, as soon as you leave the five boroughs, really. We're in regional theater world. Um, it's, it's a very New Yorker view of the world. So for that, I apologize. But all that said, let's get started with the commercial option. What it is, what it's not, and what the major financial terms of a commercial option are. First, you heard from Dave about the Dramatist Guild. The Dramatist Guild has promulgated two contracts, uh, two author contracts called the Approved Production Contracts. We call them the APC for short. They are for plays and musicals as applicable. And they contain all the minimum terms that the Dramatist Guild and the Broadway League basically agree that are acceptable um, for engaging Dramatist Guild members to, for, for your play, as the author of your play. Um, they're only used for Broadway and other first class productions. Uh, specifically for national touring productions, we will also use an APC. And sometimes in certain wonky circumstances for West End productions, if a West End production comes first, um, West End being 
being the Broadway equivalent in the United Kingdom. We will use an APC. Um, it's more, so if you're producing a Broadway production, it is more than likely that you are signing an APC with the author and then sending it off to the guild first for their review and certification and hopefully they approve it and certify it on the first round, but often it takes a few tries to get the language exactly right and to get everyone to agree on the language in your APC. Um, if the author is not a member of the guild or if the author is willing to be um, in contravention of the guild standards, which sometimes they are because authors, you know, especially new authors who don't have a production history desperately want to be produced, um, you may find a Broadway contract which is not an APC, but that's becoming less and less common. Most Broadway contracts are now APCs. Now for off-Broadway productions, so second class productions, there is no APC and the parties do their own deal without too much reference to the guild, although the agreements usually but not always live up to the minimum terms of the Dramatist Bill of Rights that the guild has that you can find actually on the guild's website. I think that's available to everyone. Um, so let's talk about the financial terms that you'll find in every agreement. First, you'll find the option, the option period and the option advance that goes along with it. Producers don't outright buy <coughs> a playwright's work. They option certain rights, the dramatic rights, in a certain territory for a certain period of time. And if they don't succeed in getting a commercial production produced in that period of time, the option expires and both parties go on their way without any further obligation to the other. The usual initial option time period to get a play produced by a producer once they option the play is 12 to 18 months. So from option you have 12 to 18 months to get the play produced on Broadway or off Broadway. There are usually two to three extensions for six to 12 months each. And if the producer does get a commercial production up and running in that time, the rights the producer has optioned vest and the producer can continue to produce the play and other productions of the show in the territory in which the vesting occurred until certain contractual benchmarks are not met. Usually if you're a producer and four months go without you producing the show within the territory, once you've started producing it, your rights lapse and you lose the rights in that territory. Along with this option comes an advance. It's not a fee you'll note, but it's an advance against all the royalties which the author will receive once the show is running. How much might that advance be? It's all over the place how much that advance might be. For off-Broadway, $2,500 on the low end to $10,000 for a year's advance isn't uncommon. For Broadway, for an APC, uh, off APC play, we're talking about $5,000 for the first six months, $2,500 for the next six months. For a musical, uh, the first option payment is $18,000. Um, for the first 12 months. Now I've seen it go up on Broadway to $50,000 a year as an option period. I also saw in one crazy circumstance um, the option payment go up to $100,000 per year. Um, not likely to happen in these economic circumstances. That happened about 10 years ago and you aren't often seeing $100,000 advance payments made in these economic climates. But that's what you usually will pay for the option. So the author's making some money there. It's not great money when you think about film money, but it is some money. What the producer will also try to get, and is a major financial point for the author, are options in additional territories. Once the producer has vested in the initial territory, usually the United States and Canada, the producer will require that they have the exclusive right to produce the play in other territories. The producer, of course, will want these options to be as long as possible, allowing the branding of the producer's production here in North America and the United Kingdom, which is usually the second production, while the author has some interest in keeping these option periods shorter and receiving the money quickly because the author can then, if the option runs out, the author can then engage directly in the foreign licensing of their play without burdening it with the, the burdens of the producer's full production. The producer's trying to brand a production, whereas the author is not necessarily trying to, to go with the whole production. The author wants the play to be produced as much as possible. So this foreign option can be a heavily, heavily negotiated area. Where do we typically end up for a play? We typically end up with the North American producer only getting the rights to produce additional productions in other English speaking territories. So we're usually limited to North America, the United Kingdom and Australia, New Zealand. Usually the compensation the author will receive for the United Kingdom is about the same they will receive for the North American option. Whereas in Australia and New Zealand, it will be somewhere between 66 and 75% of what they're paid for the North American option. 
For a musical, the producer is going to want to option the play as many, in as many worldwide territories as possible. Language is less of a barrier for musicals. Um, you can produce English language musicals in many territories in the world, uh, despite English not being the first language in those territories. And the producer will want to brand the show as far as possible, with the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, the rest of the Far East, Germany, and a lot of the, and the, now the BRIC countries, um, leading the way as major territories where the producer will desire to produce the show. So how much can an author expect to receive as an advance from the producer for these foreign productions? For Japan, we're talking $75,000 to $100 for the first option period. For Germany, usually $50,000 to $75,000. For the rest of Asia, $25,000. For the UK, again, the same as North America. And for Australia and New Zealand, 66 to 75% of that which they receive in North America. Then we have royalties and amortization and royalty pools, which David started to discuss and then handed off to me to deal with amortization. Um, royalties. I'm going to pull this, uh, pull this whiteboard over here and hopefully do some visual explaining of what royalties are. See, we're in theater. We're really old-fashioned. I still work with a whiteboard and a, and a marker. Um, but royalties are the weekly compensation paid to the author and the whole creative team from each and every running production of the play produced by the commercial producer. When a play is a flop, royalties don't add up to much. But when a play is a success, some authors can make $60,000 a week or more in royalties from each production. So if you're the author of, say, Book of Mormon right now, you're probably making about $200,000 a week off that show, or maybe more. Um, Royalties are another heavily negotiated financial term, obviously, because there's a lot of money to be had. Not so much are we negotiating what the percentage royalties will be, as the percentages set forth in the APC that Dave told you about are generally accepted. But what is heavily negotiated is how the producer can kind of chop away at these royalties by a royalty pool, by amortization. The conflict will become more clear as I go over to the whiteboard and put this up. But here are the two ways in which royalties are paid. First, royalties are paid on gross weekly box office receipts, or I'm on, right? You can all hear me. Or on GWIBOR, gross weekly box office receipts. This is the traditional way that royalties are paid. This is kind of the way the authors would prefer the royalties to be paid because it's the way the most royalties are paid. When you're on gross weekly box office receipts, the standard royalty payments to authors would be 4.5% for a Broadway musical, that's pre-recoupment, it goes up after recoupment. 5% uh, going to 10% for a Broadway play. For an off-Broadway play, 6% going to 7% is your standard. Um, but there's some shift with regard to off-Broadways. So rather straightforward way of paying royalties. If your, your Guibor, your gross weekly box office receipts, is a million dollars, and the author gets 4.5% of that, the author's receiving $45,000 a week. If you're an author, that works. And to some extent, it works for plays as well, because there aren't a large group of creative team members sharing in royalties for plays. But producers, especially musical producers, are not fans of paying royalties based on gross. In fact, you're not going to find a, royal, a musical on Broadway right now that I know of paying on gross. Shrek tried it, didn't work. Uh, Disney has tried it. Oh, that's right, we're being recorded. <laughs> Disney has tried it, um, and uh, it didn't work. But <laughs> Can I just change that release I signed over there? Um, why didn't it work? Because it doesn't take into account the producer's weekly operating costs, and it doesn't take into account the production costs of the show either. You're paying strictly on what comes in at the box office. So when it doesn't take into account the weekly operating costs, the expense of all the other royalty participants in the show, or the production costs, producers can get themselves in trouble rather quickly. For example, if your gross weekly box office receipts are $650,000 and it costs, your weekly operating costs are $550,000, your author being paid on gross, your author royalty would be $29,250. You would approximately pay 10% of the gross to the other participants, the other royalty participants. 
leaving you with the remainder to the investors of a whopping $5,750 per week to try to make back the amount that they have put into that show. So how long will it take the investors to recoup the amounts they put into that show? Um, 1,739 weeks, or basically infinity. Uh, in, commercial, in commercial theater terms. Um, so that's a problem. People can be making money while investors can be losing their shirts. That's the problem with the gross royalty, gross royalty formula on Broadway. So if a production loses money, it will soon close. That's no way to run a business. And the Guild recognizes this, and the producers recognize this. So that's why we have the second way of paying royalties, which, like you said, kind of popped up out of nowhere right after the APC was agreed by everyone. And that is the weekly net operating profits formula. Paying on weekly net operating profits, which was commonly known as royalty pooling, um, although fewer shows are actually pooling royalties these days, can change the financial picture for a moderate hit. Because once the author agrees to be paid on net operating profits, or NOP, um, all the creative team members will be paid on NOP. So let's, talk, let's show you an example of how this works. If you're paid on NOP, and the gross weekly box office, again, is $650,000. Oops, I can write. $650,000. Your weekly operating costs, again, are $550,000. What you come up with then is a remainder of $100,000. That remainder is operating profit. It will be split between the creative team, so let's say 35% to creative team, and then 65% to the investors. And we will have 35,000 going to the creative team, and 65,000 going to the investors. And within that $35,000, you will find the 15.56% that has to go to the authors. So here, we see the investors getting a decent amount of money back to start recouping the production. Thank you. Um, weeks to recoupment there are 153.8 weeks. Still not wonderful, three years, but much better. So that works, but where we ended up now is dealing with amortization, which I'm going to go into really quickly because my time is running short. Um, with regard to amortization, when we talk about amortization, in the theater world, it's just like in any other world, amortization is spreading out costs over a period of time. Um, usually, as Dave said, it's 2% of the production costs. So when we're dealing with production costs, we're bringing in the amount that the whole show costs. So let's say it costs $10 million to produce a Broadway musical. You're dealing with the same set of numbers, but at this point, when you have $100,000 left, that will become your amortization. So what you have here is you're dealing with a circumstance in which technically the creative team is paid nothing. This is all before you've recouped the show. And the investors would get that $100,000 because it's being amortized to pay back the costs of producing the show, going to, to these costs. Um, looks better than it is because the creative team will never say, OK, that's fine. We'll accept zero in any given week. That's completely inequitable to not give them anything. So they will usually get what we call a minimum weekly guarantee. And each person will get a minimum weekly guarantee of, say, for the author, $6,000. For the director, maybe $3,000. It will be a flat figure in which they get a certain amount. So if the minimum weekly guarantees add up to $25,000, and you have an amortization, then there will be $75,000 left to go towards recouping the production costs of the show. This is thought basically by producers and by some author's agents to be the most equitable way to get back to recoupment. Because if you can't recoup your production costs, no one else is going to produce your show. What we tend to fight about in amortization is what the minimum an author is guaranteed to make and will there be some sort of clawback after recoupment? Will the author be able to make some money back after recoupment, more than they otherwise would have made if this amortization formula has been applied? Finally, subsidiary rights. Subsidiary rights are the fourth area that is heavily negotiated. Dave talked to you about them. But think about a musical such as Hairspray. Its life didn't end with the Broadway production or the touring production. It spawned a movie, 
which wasn't produced by the Broadway producers. Um, it's still spinning off foreign language productions all over the world, which aren't produced by the Broadway producers. And a, has a substantial life in regional theaters, in summer stock, in colleges and high schools, which are all not produced by the Broadway producers. So these are all considered in the theatrical world to be subsidiary rights. It's understood and agreed by basically everyone that the commercial producers will share in the income it's agreed. Yes. It's agreed by everyone that the commercial producers will share in the income and subsidiary rights of the author. The Guild, it seems, the position is basically that they've enhanced the, the show in some way and they should share in the subsidiary rights because they've enhanced the show. I've spoken to producers about this and producers really take the position is that, no, it's their risk that gives them the, the reason that they want to take subsidiary rights because no matter what happens on opening night and thereafter, the author's not losing $12 million on a play. Which I suppose is true. Um, but what becomes an issue in the developmental period of every play is not just that the producer is taking subsidiary rights, but a little bit of what Dave talked about, the question of should interpretive artists and developmental theaters share in those subsidiary rights? Because the big question is how far should the author's subsidiary rights be reduced? First, we'll talk a little bit about the director, <laughs> which you know how the you know how the guild feels about that. Um, the director is one of the first deals, thank you, um, that you will make going into a project. More and more directors and agents want more than their fee because they feel they're making an authorial contribution to the show. Um, the usual give now, despite the guild being very heavily against it is I'll see in almost all deals 5%. If the director is a first class director, they'll be getting 5% of the author's subsidiary rights, which is a big chunk because you think of the author being down to 60%, now the author's down to 55% of, of their rights that come out of the show. So after the director, you're still developing the show. And there are two more places where you may lose your subsidiary rights if you're the author. One is to Actors' Equity Association, the Union of the Actors. If you have a workshop production of your show, then you have to give 1.5% of your subsidiary rights to the actors, which again reduces the, the author down to now, where are we? We're at 54.5% or 53.5%. Then you might do a regional developmental production. And what happens to your subsidiary rights there? The regional theater again wants 5%. So we're bringing the, the, uh, the author of a show down to about 50%, like Dave said, of their subsidiary rights. And the question that everyone is fighting these days in theater is, is that equitable? Is that too much to be taken away from the author? It's an argument that goes on. It's an argument that really has not been solved yet. Producers will say, we're mired in risk, and we have to transfer that risk at some extent to the author. The Guild will say, like Dave said, the author has worked for years on this play and may not see anything. But the question goes on about interpretive artists and whether they should share in subsidiary rights, and it is a question that is likely to be argued for, as far as I can see, into the future um, as the author and the producer fight over who is obligated to pay these subsidiary rights. Thank you very much. And I will now complete my this. Thank you. <laughs> you think that's complicated? Wait till you hear how music rights get split up. Oh. Um, great. So our last, the last thing we're going to do here, I'm going to introduce Carol, and then she is going to promptly turn it back over to our little skit we're going to do. Um, but first, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Carol Kaplan, who is uh, entertainment counsel for Paul Weiss in New York. Um, those of you who don't know, Paul Weiss is where Dean Rubin got his start after, out, of, out of law school, uh, also as an entertainment attorney there. Um, it's, a, it's probably the entertainment firm in New York, the, as far as big law goes. Um, uh, Carol joined Paul Weiss in 2000 and is with the firm for about 12 years now. Uh, she's uh, it's been in the entertainment department at least since 2009. Uh, she works in legitimate theater, uh, film, TV, and book publishing. Um, she's uh, worked with legal teams uh, in adapting their work to Broadway. Uh, she's worked for independent film, documentary filmmakers, screenwriters, directors, investors, and creative talent. Uh, she was senior counsel at Nickelodeon uh, at MTV. And uh, prior to becoming uh, a lawyer, uh, Ms. Kaplan was uh, an artist. 
Uh, she, she worked in film, TV, and theater. Um, she, was a, she was a playwright. And she still writes quite frequently, as a matter of fact. Uh, she was also editor-in-chief of the NYU Law Review, so she's familiar with how our editorial process works. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to present uh, Ms. Carol Kaplan. Thank you. Oh, good. This is on. Hi, everybody. Before we get to our show part of the show and tell, uh, just a couple of comments. I'm, I'm going to shift the emphasis a little bit away from you've had some really granular um, uh, exposure to what goes into the business deal of negotiating with playwrights. I'm going to pull back a little bit, not much, not, not certainly not as wide and global as a perspective on copyright that you had this morning. But I am going to talk a little bit about the history that brought us to the types of deals that you've heard spoken about, and then also looking to the future. Um, and I'm going to compare a little bit the, um, the, the, the right structures that you've heard about in theater and how they compare to right structures in what I call mediated entertainment, which is not an original term that I've created, I've made up. Uh, mediated entertainment being the form of entertainment that happens through a medium, film, television, what you see on the internet, et cetera. Um, one of the things that um, is, is, is most important in distinguishing live theater from mediated entertainment is that live theater is live. And that has big ramifications for copyright law and how rights are allocated. So with that, we now get to our show part of the uh, presentation. And Shane and Mike, I would be very grateful if you would step up. Well, even though there is uh, an, an education exception in the Copyright Act, you'd be pleased to know that this is in the public domain. Uh, it was written in, uh, I think, 1883. So uh, it was never protected in the US, as a matter of fact. I don't, I don't need it. Oh, yeah, you don't need it? Oh, all right. <laughs> okay. Professional over here. Um, and you'll never look at us the same way again. Should, should we just say what it's from? Sure. It's, this is the, the famous orphan often scene from the Pirates of Penzance. Um, if anyone knows what that is, I would like to be your friend. Uh, <laughs> But to give you uh, a little bit of context, I'm playing the, the major general who has, uh, who's, who's wards or the entire female chorus uh, of the play. Mike's playing the pirate king who has decided to, uh, yeah. So he want, he's going to marry all of them. Um, uh, he's going to marry all of them, uh, except for the pirates of Penzance uh, as, as, a, as a band are, um, are really terrible pirates. They were actually a group of uh, slightly deranged British noblemen who decided that being a pirate sounded fun, uh, but they don't know how to do it. And because they are all orphans, they let any, every ship they take over um, uh, just tells them that they're all orphans, and so they, they let them go. So they let any, anyone who's an orphan, they, they let, let them go on their way. So that's the, the at the beginning of this scene, uh, the pirate king has just come to, um, uh, to seize all the Major General's daughters, and the Major General suddenly has an idea to try to keep him from, from doing what he's about to do. Okay. I ask you, have you ever known what it is to be an orphan? Orphan? Y yes, orphan. Have you ever known what it is to be one? I say, orphan. <sighs> I don't think we quite understand one another. <clears throat> now, I ask, have you ever known what it is to be an orphan? And you say, orphan. Now, as I understand it, you are merely repeating the word often to show you understand me. I didn't repeat the word often. Pardon me, you did indeed. I only repeated it once. True, but you repeated it. But not often. Stop. I think I see we're getting confused. <laughs> when you say often, do you mean often a person who has lost his parents or often frequently? Ah, I beg pardon. I see what you Ah, so you said often, frequently. No, only once. Exactly, you said often, frequently, only once. And scene. <laughs> so uh, you've seen the live performance. Now we're going to see a video version of the live performance that was shot earlier. And note the uh, extreme care taken to set, lighting, <laughs> and costuming. Do you ever know what it is to be an orphan? Oh, so. Orphan? Yes, orphan. Have you ever known what it is to be one? I say, orphan. Uh, 
I don't think we quite understand one another. <clears throat> now, I ask, can you ever know what it is to be an orphan? And you say, orphan. <clears throat> now, as I understand it, you are merely repeating the word orphan to show you understand me. I didn't repeat the word orphan. Pardon me, you did indeed. I only repeated it once. Oh, but you repeated it, but not orphan. Stop! I think I see you are getting confused. <clears throat> When you say orphan, uh, do you mean orphan, a person who has lost his parents, or orphan frequently? Ah, I beg pardon. I see what you mean. Frequently. Ah, ah so you said orphan frequently. No, only once. Exactly. You said orphan frequently only once. All right. <laughs> yes, so have a round of applause. Thank you both very, very much. Um, so the, the purpose of this is, is somewhat obvious. We had in the beginning a live performance. You had two people um, reading, well, in one learning, one wrote, one reading, words that had been written by a third party. Um, under copyright law, there is no copyright in the live performance. The work that the two of them did existed for this ephemeral moment when they were here in this room performing. It's gone, it's finished, it's over, there's no fixed form of it. So that was it. It was a moment in time. We got to watch it. We got to enjoy it. And it's over. And there's, there's no way that anybody has a copyright in what those people did in the room. The copyright exists in the written text that was performed. That written text happens to be in the public domain now, so there is no copyright. There's a difference, though, when exactly the same scene was put on video. If I was the producer, I would have paid the two of them to perform, I would have paid somebody to hold the video camera, a director of photography a di um, a, and a director. There would have been creative decisions made about things like where the camera should be placed. That actually involved three different cameras. I don't, was it done simultaneously? No, three okay. different takes. Three different takes, so you can see there's a certain amount of time, investment, of, they were, if that was being done commercially, that producer would have had to have paid for an entire day of filming to get those two minutes. The camera would have been played, the, the same uh, sh uh, scene would have probably been paid anything from, um, you know, three for the three camera angles to 300 times, depending on how often the actor said, no, no, sorry, I, just, I have to do that again. Um, the D DP might have said, hey, you know what, the lighting was off, let's run that again. So you've heard about the multiple takes in, 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 any, um, in any shoot. So you have no idea how many takes it might have actually taken to put those three camera angles up on that screen. Um, there would, and there are, as I say, creative decisions. Had that actually been um, a shoot, we would have, I would have hired a costume designer. I would have hired a set designer. I would have hired a whole you know, array of people to make sure that, the actors, that everybody's experience on the day was a livable one, you know, food and all those sorts of things. So the cost involved in that um, two-minute recorded piece are massively greater if it was being done commercially than the cost involved. Now, I know if we were doing the play commercially, there would be costs involved as well because we'd be paying performers to show up at rehearsals and do all of that sort of thing. But the, purpose, the point being that as producer, I get to own that video. That's mine. I own it. And I own it because it's a fixed expression. And it goes on, you know, it, it, every time it's shown, it's going to look exactly the same. It's fixed. I get to own it under copyright law if I've entered into the right types of agreements with all the people involved, which I'm going to be talking about in a little bit. As the producer of the live stage piece, I own nothing. Those performances happen. They're finished. They're done. I don't own any of it. Um, the actors don't own the performance that they just did, which goes to David's point at the beginning. Actors own nothing of the live performance. Um, as a theater producer, though, I'm paying people for the use of their time and their skills to put up the live show, but I don't own anything that I can, that you know, I don't, as a copyright matter, own what they've done. So I just wanted to give you all a chance to kind of grasp those two differences, and now here we go. Um, so, as I say, the, the difference in, in, in rights and ownership in theater and, and mediated entertainment have absolutely everything to do with the fixed form of, um, of the work. 
And in, in the live stage piece that you just saw, as I said, the ownership right is, is, uh, resides in the text. Um, and so the question always becomes, who owns that text? Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about the history of how it is in theater that authors own their text rather than the person commissioning the text from the author or the person producing that for the first time. And this is going to be an incredibly superficial um, discussion about some of the history. Um, and there are essentially two threads in this history. The first looks at the evolution of copyright law very, very briefly, and I defer here to the far more erudite and uh, sophisticated copyright professors who are in this room. Um, you know, this is, this is a, 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 a very sort of layperson's um, account of it, as well as a history of customs and practices in the uh, theater industry. So one of the articles, there, there are a couple of law, uh, law review articles, or law journal articles that I've, I've referred to. One of them is Jessica Littman's um, uh, article published in 1987 called Copyright Compromise and Legislative History, which I refer to in the second part of the, the, um, the historic overview. And then the other is her more recent article called um, uh, The Invention of Common Law Play Right. Um, she, in her article, gives a pretty fascinating account of the customs and practices in theatre in the Elizabethan times, uh, is Elizabethan Tudor and Restoration England. Um, and, the, uh, and she talks about how copyright, copyright law changed as a result of efforts of playwrights and theatre company owners to gain greater, con greater control over public performance rights in their plays. The notion of a public performance right, as Shane mentioned, didn't actually exist as a proprietary right. You could own the right in the published script, but not in the public performance. Um, and it was only in 1833, so that's, you know, Elizabethan theater, Shakespeare, we're talking about the 1560s. So it took until 1833 for uh, Parliament to recognize the concept of a separate proprietary performance right in a dramatic work. Um, so, what, what it, so that was the, the legal status, but the, the custom and practice in the industry that had, give, that had really emerged out of um, Elizabethan theatre was that playwrights belonged to theatre companies. They were paid salaries by theatre companies, so in a sense they were work-for-hire uh, deals, um, they, and, and whatever they did was owned by the company. So the company had a sort of a repertoire of plays, and they owned the play, and they got to... Uh, the, and the companies were either run by, um, by the time you get into the 1800s in the UK, uh, you've had a proliferation of theatres that are no longer, the, no longer theatres um, that are sort of run by and regulated by the crown. They're now uh, sort of, um, you know, out in the, in, in the more sort of competitive marketplace. And you have actor managers who are running these theatres. And essentially, they had this sense of ownership of the play that was written by playwrights. At this time, playwrights also weren't necessarily employed by theater companies. They were more of a freelance type of creator. And the actor manager would get the right to do the play and play the, pay the playwright a flat, flat fee. And so usually, there was this flat fee payment up front. And then the playwright got the opportunity to get what is sort of the origin of our royalty structure there was often what's called a benefit performance, where one performance of the play, or maybe three performances of the play, were done for the playwright's benefit, where the playwright got to keep the net profits of that performance. So after everybody had been paid, whatever was left went to the playwright. But there was still this notion that the, the, the actor manager, or the, co the company, owned the performance right in the play. Um, in the 18th and 19th centuries in the US, there was a very similar kind of, um, of, of custom and practice. Most of the theater being done in the US in those times was British import theater. Not much has changed. Um, and when the British, what was happening is British acting companies were coming over to the US and performing their plays, often on these tours that went around the country. And they just brought over the same custom and practice. And American playwrights were sort of brought into that as the custom and practice. Uh, so, um, so they too were being paid a flat fee for their, their for the per performance rights in their plays, and um, in fact, Shane's very own was it a note or an article? Uh, it was a note. A note. 
Um, he talks about um, stock and amateur licensing in America, and he does a really terrific review of the history of performing rights in the US um, and, and the sort of lack of copyright protection for playwrights in the US in the 19th century. Um, the, the change that happened in the US where there was, uh, the, 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 there was a similar situation with the Copyright Act of 1790 not recognizing a performance right as a separate right. And that changed in the US in 1956. Um, and that's really the focus uh, of one section of, of Shane's paper. Um, what that, that new, what the act did in 1956 was recognized um, the proprietary performing right in dramatic texts and gave proprietors of dramatic works the exclusive right to act, perform, or represent their work. Because, however, of the custom and practice that whoever did the first production of the play was considered to own the play, that became a right that really was, um, was, was used by these actor managers of companies to enjoin competing productions of plays. So there was not a sense that the playwright got this inherent uh, ownership of the copyright in their play. This, the sense was more that these acting companies, the producer, owned all of the subsequent rights in the play once they'd put up the first performance. So um, this pretty much was the way things happened in America until the early 19-teens and 20s. And the, the thing that, that caused a sea change here was the emergence of the motion picture industry because the motion picture industry was hungry for content and they looked to Broadway for content. And what, what happened was the, um, a bunch of uh, sort of powerful Broadway producers, I have not yet been able to find out who all of the, what all of their names are, but there were seven Broadway producers who entered into a deal with a Fox um, picture company, uh, 20th Century Fox Film Corporation, it was called at the time, um, because essentially what was happening is that these producers were getting the rights to the play and considering themselves to have all of the rights in the play, and they went and cut a deal with Fox saying, you finance our production on Broadway and we'll give you the film rights to these plays. So essentially they were entering into pre-sale deals where they were negotiating a deal for the film rights of a play before the play had actually been produced. It caused an outcry in the writing community because writers felt like by pre-selling the value of the film rights in the play, there was, there was no opportunity for these to be out to bid. There was no competition. There was no way for the writer to actually get the benefit of the value of his play once it had been put on Broadway because there was this pre-sale deal. Um, and writers might get a percentage of that pre-sale deal, but they were not, be, they were ne they were not sitting at the bargaining table. Um, they, uh, write, authors, dra drama, this is before the, uh, the, uh, um, the coming into being of the Dramatist Guild. So um, playwrights or dramatists, and that again is, you know, playwrights who are writing dramatic plays as well as the composers, book writers, and lyricists of musical plays, uh, were mem members of uh, what was called at the time the Authors League, I think. So they became activists and, uh, and sort of through collective action, they developed what was the minimum basic agreement, which is the precursor to something called the minimum basic production contract, which was the precursor to the approved production contract that you've heard spoken about today. And they, just, they sat down and they negotiated with them on one side of the table and Broadway producers on the other side of the table what they thought this contract should look like. They tried to standardize deals between playwrights and producers because the deals had been all over the place. Sometimes when that playwright entered into the first deal with a producer, if, you, if they had greater stature, they were able to hold back certain rights. They were able to say, all right, you're going to get the rights to do the Broadway production, but I'm going to hold on to the film rights. I'm going to hold on to the, the publishing rights. But if you didn't have any stature in the business, you were kind of out of luck. You gave it all up. So the idea of creating this standardized contract which was not collectively bargained. It was, it was individually bargained between a group of writers and a group of producers. Um, you, you, um, by having the standardized contract, you could basically say, okay, Broadway community, this is how it's gonna work from now on. 
you're not getting everything. You're going to get this limited license to put on my play for a period of time in these territories, and this is how much you're going to pay me, and I'm going to hold on to the copyright. What was remarkable to the playwrights was that this um, negotiation actually happened and, 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 and was concluded without too much ado. And so um, by uh, uh, about, I think, sort of ni late 1920s, early 30s, there was this minimum basic agreement in place. Um, so there was this collective action by playwrights that changed the custom and practice of the playwriting, uh, of the theater industry here. Um, at the same time, though, we have this other thing that was occurring in copyright law in the U.S. So again, very superficially, in 1976, when the new Copyright Act uh, was being passed, five minutes, okay. We're skipping that. All I'm going to say is, um, <laughs> is that the, the Copyright Act in 1976 really focused on this issue of work for hire. Well, one of the issues that was very key was the issue of work for hire. And work for hire essentially gave an employer um, the, 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 the status of an author. So if an employer had, its, had an employee create the work, the employer owned that work as if they'd created it themselves. But there was this whole other category. Authors wanted to say, if you commission me to write a work, I own that copyright. Movie, you know, movie studios, uh, book publishers, um, music publishers, etc. Record labels said, "Wait, you can't do that because we've put all of this money into putting this together. It's a collective work, and if you're going to own the copyright, you know, we it, it's just going to be far too detrimental because it means we take the copyright from you by assignment, and an assigned copyright has a termination right." So after 35 years, it can go back to you, and then we're really stuck. Um, so there was this sort of, the, basically, all of the interest groups sat around a table and negotiated this work for hire provision, which said there are these certain categories of works that can qualify as works made for hire if you have a written agreement, if you negotiate it ahead of time, etc. What's interesting about that is plays were not included in this category. Um, I, the, you know, a couple of conjectures I have about why. One is I think that because the producers and authors had already kind of settled their differences, they were not uh, too, uh, and, and they, they were continuing to negotiate this commonly agreed to agreement, the MVPC, over this entire period. As you, it's, it's been negotiated on a somewhat frequent basis up until about 1992, and then everybody stopped talking about it. Um, but there's, that's a, a process that might be revisited again. Um, essentially, the, the other thing is I feel, think is that in the 1970s, the flow of content was really in the other direction. It was similar to the 1920s where people were looking to Broadway for underlying rights. Um, motion picture producers were not thinking of Broadway as a destination, that they wanted to commission work for Broadway. They were rather taking Broadway plays and adapting them to movies. So now I have to get to the real heart of my presentation in the next three minutes, which I'm probably going to go over just a bit. I hope that's okay. Um, what's happened since then, though, is another shift, which is um, a, a shift that is going to impact and is already impacting on the way in which rights um, are allocated between producers and creators in the theater world. Um, and. Uh, the reason for this is that in the last decade, there has been an increasing number of what I would call Hollywood producers. What I really mean are motion picture companies, studios, and media, uh, media conglomerates looking to Broadway as a destination, as a place where they can take their own intellectual property and commission a work based on their intellectual property to go up on the Broadway stage. Uh, setting them aside, as we know, there have been tons of Broadway musical versions of movies for really for since you know the 1920s. Um, but uh, but generally, the speed at which or the, the proliferation of movies as underlying works for Broadway musicals has has increased exponentially quite recently. Um, in a typical traditional. Uh, m movie to musical, or as we sometimes call them, movical situation. You have an independent traditional Broadway producer who goes to the, m the movie studio and says, hey, I want to option the underlying rights, so I want to get the stage rights to your film, Hairspray, and I want to turn it into a musical. And they make an underlying rights deal with the studio, and the studio then steps back and has no further relationship. They just collect passive 
uh, money based on the use of their intellectual property in the Broadway show. Um, the one exception to that was Disney. Disney started with Beauty and the Beast actually being the active producer of the Broadway version of its intellectual property. Um, it did that, and Beauty and the Beast opened in 1994, followed shortly after thereafter with The Lion King. Those two shows, not immediately, but over time, began to shift uh, the, the landscape. So you had, uh, really, Disney was the only company doing this for quite a while. You, you had a couple of others were Fox Searchlight was one of the producers of the Full Monty in 2000. Uh, Warner Brothers tried to put in on a production of Lestat in 2006, which, to quote Carter, didn't work so well. Um, then you had uh, Billy Elliot in 2008. Universal Pictures was one of the, uh, and working title were producers. Uh, Warner Brothers came back in 2010 with a, a Broadway adaptation of Elf. Um, and suddenly Hollywood started to take note. And it wasn't just because there were names above the credits that had producers, you know, Hollywood Studios on them. I have, need just a couple of minutes. What really happened was a change in the Broadway grosses of the industry. So by 2006, when more of these studios started to move into the Broadway field, uh, Beauty and the Beast and uh, The Lion King had been running for an extraordinary long time. Um, according to Disney's official blog post on August 2012, there have been 19 different companies of The Lion King worldwide, and it has grossed over 4.8 billion worldwide. Um, uh, Beauty and the Beast had grossed just on Broadway after it closed, after, uh, after a, a long run, it closed in 2007, had grossed just under half a billion dollars. That's just on Broadway, right? We're not talking about all of the other types of productions of the companies that Carter was speaking about. Um, Wicked, which has Universal as a producer, even though it's not based on an actual movie, it's obviously based somewhat on Wizard of Oz, and Universal was in the process of developing um, a, a, a movie based on the book that Wicked is based on. Um, and working with a Broadway producer, and they decided, hey, let's not make the movie of this, let's just go to Broadway, which is how Universal ended up as a producer, and that is probably one of the best decisions they've ever made. Uh, Wicked has, again, grossed about two billion worldwide, and it's been running, um, uh, it's opened in 2003, so it's just under 10 years. And these numbers are really significant to um, media companies and to the motion picture studios. So one of the issues that has arisen with this flood of, or this interest from these motion picture companies is what happens when they sit down to negotiate the deal with the author. The author is used to owning a copyright. The motion picture companies and these media companies are absolutely never in a billion years going to like the idea of giving up control of a right, an ownership right, in some work that has is based on their own proprietary intellectual property. In the movie business, they have something that they can do to prevent that. They enter into a work-for-hire agreement, they own all of the rights of anything that's created based on their intellectual property, and they get to do with it whatever they want. In the theater business, if they enter into a standard deal, they might have you know, an $8 billion franchise um, that they've spent 25, 35 years sinking money and resources and, and, and uh, effort into, and all of a sudden, because they decide to take it to, to Broadway, they have a playwright that now has some control over what could be a very important part of that franchise. So the negotiation between the media company and the playwright has caused the shift again in how these rights are allocated, with more control going to the movie studios, um, both over approvals, over how uses will be made of the, the new work, um, and, 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 and in, con in return for getting greater control and, in a sense, getting what would be a perpetual license of the copyright from the playwright, they're paying more. So a lot of the, uh, the, the, the financial terms that you've seen described in terms of what option payments are and what payments are for future companies are different in these other deals. What remains pretty consistent is the, is the royalty package because that actually is determined by the actual economics of Broadway, the economics of putting up a play. But almost all other types of compensation and the types of revenue streams, uh, there's been a reverse. And we're, we're looking a little bit more 
like the, the sort of um, uh, structure that existed earlier in the 20th century, just in certain respects, certainly not altogether, um, and uh, then we have in the last, uh, you know, up until, up until the, the new millennium. Um, so that's something that, you know, I, I, I can happily go into a little more detail in the question and answer session because I've basically not gone into any of the details of how those deals are changing, uh, but that's just to give you an overview of where things are in the state of the author deal right now on Broadway. Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions if anyone has them. This one is, okay. <laughs> um, can, can I sing now? Yeah, please do, um, it's required. So uh, just a, a thank you very much. I, I learned a lot, uh, a couple of questions. Uh, could you speak just a, a few minutes um, about the rare cases where uh, not a West End play? Uh, I, 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 would that change what you were describing? Um, uh, the second is, um, I, I'm not sure I understand the difference between dealing with the play and the uh, second where we're dealing with the musical where obviously you're going to negotiate finite royalty pool and so publishers are too greedy that work. Uh, well, I could give a little you know, thing, then you can fill in the gaps if that's okay. So you, that's a really good question. I'm going to answer the second one first, um, which is that the uh, the description of the royalty package um, is really one that, for a musical, um, includes a, a book writer, a composer, and a lyricist as components. You could have a composer that's created that is actually 20 people. Right? But the 20 people get a single composer component of a royalty. So when, you go, when you're putting up um, a musical that involves a lot of pre-existing work, as the producer, what you desperately need is for every composer who's part of the song and every lyricist who's part of the song to accept a proportional share of that piece of the pie that's allocated to a composer. So for example, if you're talking about the gross royalty, the piece of the pie that gets allocated to a composer is 1.5% of the gross, and it's 5.19%, completely random numbers, um, of net profits when it's a royalty pool. So if you have 20 songs in the show, and two of them are written, you know, are, are pre-existing, you're going to give you know, tw two out of 20 as the fraction that will be allocated to each of the composer and the lyricists. And if they're multiple composers and lyricists, they would then allocate it between themselves of that, that chunk of the royalty. So that's how, that's generally how, and, and music publishers for the most part, there's one in particular that's very non-cooperative with us, but for the most part, music publish, publishers cooperate and understand that if they have an understanding of how the, the business of theater works because the economics are very unforgiving in a Broadway play. The margins are very, very difficult. And for every one of the Wicked's and the Books of Mormon and everything else, you know, that's an extraordinary success and is going to make two billion to four billion a year there are, you know, a hundred that are just going to open and close within three to three weeks to, you know, three months with a complete and total loss. So you actually have to do the economics of Broadway based on the most likely scenario, which unfortunately is failure. Um, and then, though, you know, when there is a success, everybody is going to make out like bandits. So that's my response to that. I don't think there's oh, anything. Although I would add that the music rights holders started out very amenable to making money off Broadway because it was a new place for them to start making money once all of these jukebox musicals um, started hitting about a decade ago. Now they have become much more sophisticated and I've actually seen advances to them going up much higher than you would normally. 
yeah, sometimes. <laughs> but they have become, um, they, their advances are now getting much higher than they were. So they they're getting out of whack with a normal Broadway structure often. You have to pay music rights holders, especially the big ones, the Warner Chapels, the Universal Music Groups, um, a, a fairly significant advance sometimes. And, and recently I've seen a few of them um, really pushing back on gross royalties. There's one in particular, we may be speaking about the same one, but that pushes back on the royalty pool structure fairly hard now. Um, and you also asked about the foreign, foreign, foreign translation. Um, I'm dealing with one of these now, and it's kind of catch as catch can, because it's a, the one I'm dealing with is a, a Spanish play, and it's going to need a, a direct translation and then an adapter. So basically, as we have it, you should probably cover your ears. <laughs> um, no way. <laughs> but, uh, and it's off Broadway, though. So um, the royalty that is otherwise payable to the author is being reduced in this circumstance to make room for the adapter and the translator. Now, is that how it always works? Uh, this is one of the few I've done. I haven't worked on that many non-West End productions. So, From what I've seen, that we usually try to, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but we usually try to shoehorn uh, shoe, shoehorn the uh, foreign production into the Broadway or the U.S. scheme, or the, which comes from the U.K. scheme, under the argument that if you want to do things here, you do it our way. We know what we're doing. Right. I think also the, the Guild does actually allow for um, adaptations and translators' work to be included in, if it's a straight play, to be included in the royalty that's paid. Uh, playwright, so the playwright's royalty can be reduced to accommodate in, in certain circumstances. In most circumstances, there are certain exceptions to accommodate those additional payments. So, oh, musicals. Let's <laughs> talk about. Right, interpretive artists. The interpretive artists get paid. They get paid a, a pension and royalty. They have minimums that have been collectively bargained. They're collectively bargained generally every three years. Um, well, I tend to put them against each other to some extent, yes. I mean, yeah. there, there is definitely um, a conflict between what the interpretive artists want and what the author has traditionally gotten. Um, it, they, everyone tries to keep it out of the artist's hands and in the hands of the agents and lawyers so it doesn't affect them when they're in the workroom. Yeah. Right. It's, it's complicated. Yeah, it's, well, I tell you, there's something about, though, the, the deal with the directors, and, and um, I'm going to set aside here my, you know, my own personal view on this as a playwright, um, and it doesn't come up very often in straight plays. It really comes up in musicals where you often have the director working with the, um, the author team. Often, even before a composer and lyricist are brought on, you have a director often working with a book writer. Um, directors do make a significant contribution. There's actually a copyright basis for giving them some share of the subsidiary rights. If they've made contribution, you know, you, how, who's going to sit there and try and figure out what was contributed by the author, what was an idea of the director. In a sense, what the subsidiary right participation does is simplifies the process and just says, everything, director, that you do that, that has some authorial type of content that affects the structure of the play, that has your suggestion about where a song could be, where you scribbled notes on the side of, of the script suggesting dialogue changes, everything that you've done is going to be owned by the author. So, as a, it, it, so you enter into a deal with the director for a developmental process that's a work for hire deal that says the results and proceeds of all of the contributions of the director will belong to the author. The quid pro quo for that is, and the director is going to get a piece of the author's income for the life of the play. 
The thing where I think the, con con the, the con controversy arises is how much should they get? What I have seen is, is, is an issue is that the director's share seems to, you know, has cre crept up um, over time. Um, I, what I find most interesting is you often have agents who represent both the director and the author, and I often wonder how on earth they deal with that conflict of interest in their own, their own office. But, um, Profitably. I, <laughs> um, but I think that that you know you're right. I mean, and it's something that I think the guild and the the the, the society of stage choreographers, well, directors, and society. Of directors well, we're talking about it now, and 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 I, w I I do take exception to a couple things you say with full respect. But the, the uh, you know first of all, we're talking about just first class, and there's this thing in on Broadway that that agents refer to one agent in particular as the five percent club for for his directors. Uh, who, who have been on Broadway, but suddenly all directors belong to the 5% club. So you have people in West Virginia and out in Ohio who say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm part of the 5% club now because I say so. Because I woke up a week ago and I decided I was going to be a director. You know, there's no certification of, of directorial talent except box office success. So you have way too many people saying that they deserve some sort of piece of the author's net. Uh, so even at the first cl class level, it's controversial. Outside of first class, I, I wouldn't even want to hear about it. Please don't tell me about it. It just <laughs> upsets me. Uh, second, secondly, the, the idea that, there, that, um, that there's some sort of vagueness in copyright law of, of whether or not the directors have an authorial contribution or not, I think is, is mistaken. We have plenty of case law. Thompson v. Larson, the rent case, although that was about a dramaturg, it did set aside two very clear criteria, and the Guild kind of has teased out a third criteria, that if, if two people are, for there to be a co-authorship, three things have to exist, according to the Guild. All of these are in Thompson v. Larson. One, the director has to have been there, the other person, the subordinate author, has to have been there since the inception of the piece. Number two, the dominant author has to have explicitly intended for there to be a co-authorship. In other words, if you go on a date with someone, you don't wind up married to them for the rest of your life without intending to do that. Same thing with authors and directors. If you bring a director on board or a dramaturg on board, you don't wake up one morning and say, wow, I'm a co-author now. And third, and perhaps most importantly, uh, the director has to have contributed work that is on its own copyrightable. So if a director says, why don't, we make, why don't we move this song from here to here, that's not a copyrightable contribution. If a director says, why don't you make this character uh, from Christchurch and give him a New Zealand accent, uh, somebody has to go in there and actually write that and create that. That's just an idea, right? And ideas are not copyrightable. So it's the expression and the author has to do that. Also, there's the fact that the author is not just absorbing and accepting every suggestion by the director or dramaturg. They're, they're uh, executing an executive decision, uh, de, you know, executive level decision making, uh, and that's what gives them authority. That's authorial, that's the same, that's why it's the same route. They're not just taking every suggestion the director makes. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> We're gonna no, Ruth? Uh, <laughs> Battle was Perfect. Battle. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 